Hey everyone, this is Alex Lindsay sitting in for Leo, who is down covering E3. I'm going to be here with uh, Chris Breen and Andy Anatko, and we're going to be talking about uh, new Mac minis. We're going to be talking about server meltdowns for AT&T as the new iPhone is launched. And we're also going to be asking, is that a MiFi in your iPad, or are you just happy to get online? Coming up next here on Mac Break Weekly. Netcasts you love from people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for MacBreak Weekly is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is MacBreak Weekly, episode 199 for June 15th, 2010. Sorry, our servers are busy. Mac Break Weekly is brought to you by Ford and Voice Activated Sync, featuring true hands free calling, turn by turn directions, 911 assist, and more. Available exclusively on Ford, Lincoln, and Mercury vehicles. For more details, visit SyncMyRidePodcast.com. And by Carbon, the leader in online backup. Backup your PC or Mac off site, securely, and automatically. For a free trial offer plus two free months with purchase, go to Carbonite.com, offer code MacBreak. And by Audible.com. To download a free audiobook of your choice, go to Audible.com slash MacBreak. Hey everyone, welcome back to Mac Break Weekly. This is Alex Lindsay sitting in for Leo, who is in uh, LA covering E3. In fact, we're going to be jumping to, for those of you watching live, we're going to be jumping to E3 uh, a little bit later at noon uh, as it opens. Uh, Leo is going to be, uh, going to be covering that. And so it should be, uh, uh, should be a lot of fun, but we're going to, but of course, we're going to stick to uh, Macintosh for the next uh, hour or so. So uh, uh, joining me today, we've got uh, Andy Anatko. Hey, Andy. Hello, Alex. And uh, it's uh, it's good to see you. You were just here. I just feel like I you know were, you were just I, the misty here. watercolored memories of the of the Twit Cottage that were. <laughs> <laughs> it was a beautiful the air, thing. The air conditioning, the the complimentary beverages, <laughs> the, the, the 3D camera. I I have a great shot of you playing with Diet Coke, uh, uh, in 3D, which is, we'll have to post somewhere. It, it, it should be should be a good sponsorship it's opportunity. Yes. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Also here uh, is uh, the illustrious. The wondrous Christopher Breen. Hey, Chris. How's it going? Uh, hang on a second. I'm, I'm trying to order an iPhone. <laughs> uh, it's only been four hours. I, I, sw I swear, this time it's going to work. <laughs> so this, this is, of course, the, uh, the, the, the story, the top story of today is that, is that we have, um, of course, the iPhone is available for pre-order, theoretically. Theoretically order for pre-order, uh, available for pre-order. Um, the iPhone 4, of course, uh, uh, is supposed to come out today. Uh, and there's been a lot of changes, and it's, it's hard to tell exactly what has caused the issue because there's been a lot of changes. Apple has added a new, uh, uh, a new application. Uh, uh, they have, they've put this all, all the stuff up. They've set up the web page, and you can get through part of it, right? But not quite all the way. Is anyone getting an order through, uh, Chris? Uh, no, let's see. I started um, seven o'clock a.m. Pacific time. It's now uh, three hours later. I've been trying for two and a half hours. Uh, <laughs> I've I've reached various levels of success. Um, there's the crashes immediately. There's the getting through to checking your information on AT and T, and then timing out. And I, I stumbled upon upon something unique twice, where uh, I actually get through. It goes through AT and T, and then it says. I'm sorry, we can't process your order because uh, your bill hasn't been paid. And so they <laughs> throw you out for that reason. And then you go back to the beginning and then it times out a bunch of times. So, is, is that kind of a little bit like the check is in the mail? It, it is kind of like that. It's sort of like you feel like, okay, I finally, I, I got those front row seats to, <laughs> you know, the Nirvana get together again. They brought Kurt back from heaven and, and, and they're going to be able to see him. And then... Oh, I'm sorry. We won't accept your credit card information, and you have to start back at the end of the line again. So uh, it's I still haven't been successful. I did, however, finally order in-store pickup, thinking that will be my backup plan, and got through using Apple's app. And uh, and I got a message. I got a confirmation saying your phone will only be six hundred 
dollars when, when AT and T told me it would be list price plus eighteen bucks. When did you buy your three GS? I bought it the first day. Interesting, because yeah, I I got the you know I did the same thing where I text messaged uh, the 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 magic number and it told me eighteen dollars uh, as well. Right. Um, now, Andy, have you are you pre ordering uh, an iPhone or have you tried? Uh, no, because I, I feel as though ordering Apple stuff has become like trying to get Coldplay tickets where, <laughs> you know, they, you, it, the whole process is just to underscore you, sir, are a chump. There, there are people who are meant to get these. There are people who are meant to buy it from the people who got them and pay a 400 percent markup. I know that's not what's that's not what's happening here. But when 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 a consumer item becomes so difficult to think to, to purchase that it becomes a little bit like a Candyland game, you know, where roll the dice one, two, three. Oh, your web browser had a DNS failure. Go back five spaces and go to the back of the the virtual queue again. Oh well. You got to the head of the line. Oh, but the white one is sold out. Go back, go back eight spaces and resubmit again. Uh, it, no, it, it seems, it, it, I was surprised to see the Apple store uh, running slow. You know, that was the thing that that, that, that seemed, you know, I, I mean, the AT&T thing, you, know, you kind of expected it's AT&T. But, but the, the, to have uh, the Apple store actually just feeling like it was just barely making it through the process really surprised me this morning. And, of course, I got about as far as, to me, every single time, you know, if I was patient, I would just click it and I'd go back to doing whatever I was doing. I'd come back and I'd be on another page and I'd click on that and I'd do it. And I'd get to the point where... Uh, AT and T, you know, where I had to check AT and T to find out whether, you know, my my phone number and my address, and then that was the end of the road, uh, you know, in in all cases. Now it turns out there's there there's a reports that there people are actually lining up in Japan uh, for the to get pre orders. <laughs> I mean, yeah, see, that's if <laughs> if if this if this were the first working cell phone in history. Then yes, it would be worth lining up for like that. Otherwise, I can wait. My dignity is worth about three and a half weeks. If that, if I have to like not get it first day and be able to have to wait a little bit, that's perfectly fine by me as a consumer. What now? What do you think is really driving the, the heavy demand? What part of the new iPhone is, are are people really that excited about to uh, to buy? I mean, is it the is it the retinal retinal display? Do you think that that is the the number one driving uh, factor of this new iPhone? Is it the front facing camera, Chris? Well, I think that there are a lot of features in here that people find attractive, but honestly, I think what may be driving a lot of the traffic today is the fact that Steve said AT&T is offering people generous terms to re-up. When prior to this in the past, when we had a, uh, we we're going from the 3G to the 3GS, the people who purchased the 3G had to pay that penalty, that, okay, I'm going to flip the phone in one year. It's going to be a lot more expensive, but I'm willing to do that. Those people like me who checked AT and T and found out no, it's actually going to be list price plus eighteen bucks. Of course, I'm going to try to get it first day. So I think that there are a lot of people like me who believe Steve with the generous terms. And actually, I think the generous terms probably will happen. I think my little message about it being six hundred dollars is something that Apple and I will have a long discussion about. And I expect that this has been a mistake because I've heard from a couple of other people who got that same message and said, no, 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 AT&T confirmed that this would be it. So I think the price is part of it. But certainly the front facing phone looks very attractive. The faster processor, the screen, people I know who've actually laid hands on the thing say the screen is fabulous. So, so yeah, we don't I think, think it's any, it's any one thing. It's not any one thing. It's, it's, it's a mixture. Yeah. yeah, I think so. Yeah. Now here's the, here's one, uh, uh, question that I have that I haven't been able to quite get to the bottom of, which is, are uh, when we go for eighteen dollars rather than the more expensive, are we giving up our uh, unlimited um, subscription for bandwidth? Unlimited, unlimited data. Yeah. No. Well, AT and T did say that if you have an existing data plan before the new plan goes into effect, you'll be grandfathered in. Uh, that even extends to iPad 3G owners who bought thought they're going to be buying just one month worth of uh, 3G service and then canceling it just to test it out. But now are feeling as though, yeah, I really would like to have unlimited data for for the life of the product. So maybe I will keep that. So it is out. the life of the product. So if you buy, if you do the eighteen dollar thing and and write a new subscription plan, you're still going to be on the unlimited if you started there. Oh, that's sorry, the whole thing. The, is it your? I'm sorry. With the with the with the 4G, I, I believe from, from what I, from what I read of app, of AT and T's press release and the questions that I asked of AT and T afterward, the impression I got was that the data plan is attached to the account and not to the device. 
So, so long as you keep paying X dollars per month for the data plan that you had before the switchover, if you upgrade your service to a new phone, again, you're basically transferring that existing SIM into the, uh, into the, uh, the 4G, then I believe that it should go, it should continue through. If you were to buy a, a 4G as a second line, then I don't believe that you would still have unlimited data, but it would still uh, be attached to that original SIM and that original account. Okay, because my, my, uh, my conspiracy theory mind um, was looking at that going, well, they give us $18 upgrade because uh, they're, we're gonna, they're gonna rewrite our subscription. I mean, that, you know, giving you that means that you're starting a new two-year plan, not continuing the plan that we bought last year. And as a result, it won't be unlimited when we, when we move forward. So, and, yeah. and I hadn't been able to find it, but it doesn't look like that's the case. So it looks like you're gonna be able to continue, the theory is you're gonna be able to continue unlimited uh, at least in the midterm. I, I, I think that's so. true. I, I've read reports of that as well, but it may be that I'm reading Andy's reports and and that's <laughs> yeah. maybe he's the source was, for all this information but i th i as, believe i've read this in a couple of different places that it is grandfathered in uh, yeah, there, there, there are times when you don't even know if the person that you're talking to at at&t or at the company truly understands the terms of the deal that their company is offering so as a consumer before i click any button to switch to uh to upgrade to the 4g believe me that's that's the one time in three years i'll be reading every single sentence of one of those just click through i agree to these terms agreements and I, and I have to admit that that for me as i look at it i, I at first i was like oh i can't believe i'm giving you know the unlimited is going to go away and if i get anything new it's, it's not going to be unlimited but i have to admit that most of my day i look at really most of my day it's wi-fi enabled you know most of my day is yeah. is um is something that i that i already i mean i don't run over my uh my limit on my 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 fi um right. you know well, and I, I was, as a matter of fact, I was using my MiFi sort of as a baseline for my usage. That to me, the five gig cap on the MiFi is pretty much perfect because there are many months out of the year when I use more than four gigs. There are very few in which I actually break it. Uh, to me, the two gig cap is a big problem because that means that there are going to be at least three or four months out of the year when I will be paying extra. Uh, it'll probably even be more than the extra five bucks a month. And it, I have to do a whole bunch of math now to figure out whether or not five bucks, five bucks, saving five bucks a month times 12 months will make up for all the overages I'm going to incur with a two gig cap. And fortunately, there is that if you go into uh, settings, you will be able to find out uh, to click on a click on a tab and find out exactly how much data you're using per month on your iPhone, so you can get a good handle on whether the changes are going to affect you or not. I agree that for a lot of people, it's just not going to be uh, something that they're even going to notice. I mean, I, I I do admit that if 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 AT and T gave me an option to do exactly what I do with my MiFi with my iPad, if I was able to, you know, uh, have five people connect to it, you know, tether not just tethering yeah. my computer but all of them for sixty bucks a month, I would just get rid of my MiFi. Right. And it would, be, it would be so much more convenient, one less device to have. Also, it would give uh, us parity with all these really great Android devices that have been coming out over the past two right. or three months. So the, the new version of the operating system will have that built in as a built in feature of the operating system. It'll still be something that the carrier will have to, uh, will probably charge extra for, but at least it's not some, some special freak system that you have to be on Sprint. Uh, in order to get this feature. Right. So that's that's definitely, I think Apple really needs to pull up its socks in terms of how well this device shares its Wi-Fi, uh, shares its internet with other devices. Right. Now the, uh, also today, uh, Apple released, as we, as we talked about, alluded to, uh, the Apple uh, Store app. So this is a new application, so you can buy your iPhone on your iPhone. Uh, Chris, uh, what did you, did you take a look at it? What do you think? I, I did. I like it. Um, what you can do on this thing is that I was able to pre-order for pickup and it was very simple and it actually worked. There was no spinning anything. You just tap it, you entered your information. And I said, great, here's the store, come and get it. It will be here starting at 7 a.m. and it will be here to close the day. After that, you, you likely give the thing up and you get a receipt for it within in minutes. So I think it's a very nice application. Um, I wish the results had been better than, than what they turned out to be, but uh, it's it's good. I wish there was a, an iPad version. I think so far it's just the iPhone version. I downloaded it to my iPad, so it looks a little funny when it's blown up 2x, but it it works. It does seem a little odd that you wouldn't have an iPad because it seems like the iPad would be the perfect device. Like, or, or, or oh yeah, maybe that's the next one coming. Uh, it, it is. Uh, I mean, I when I started playing with it this morning, I because I, I thought, oh well, maybe it will it will work better than the website as far as uh, ordering. So I tried it this morning. And I thought that, uh, you know, I was like, you know, I would never order from a website again if I had an interface like this, you know, to put this stuff together. Andy, have you have you given it a shot? Uh, just briefly, I downloaded it about an hour, hour and a half ago. 
Uh, I was, you know, it, this will sound weird, but I've, I was a little bit surprised they didn't decide to do it as an HTML5 app, given that this is something that they kind of would, want, they, given the different kinds of data that Apple pushes out to people or would like to push out to people, it seems as though you'd want to have something that was really dynamic that keeps adding features without and when having to upgrade the actual app itself. Also, it's a way to sort of emphatically state, hey, look, here's, here's you're never going to believe this, but we, we, we're eating our own dog food. Our own app, our own iPhone's uh, Apple Store app is written entirely in HTML5. So, na 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 na. Uh, so, I, I'm not sure how often I'm going to use it, though. Uh, I I don't think that it'll do anything for me personally that I couldn't get just by simply hitting the hitting apple.com and having them having a really good mobile version of that site. I, I do sometimes uh, reserve reservations at the genius uh, at the genius bar, but I'm not sure if I want to be told that oh by the way Final Cut Pro 10.4.1.8 is now 10.4.1.9. Tap this for more information. Right. Uh, yeah. We'll be right back with the Whoops, show in just on, a minute, sorry. but before we do, I really got to tell you about. Sorry. I, uh, <laughs> no, wait. Oh, the, I wanted to hear wait, what he was so, going to tell us about. Oh, Alex. Okay, well, we'll play it then. If, we, if you want to see what, what he was going to talk about, Leo was... Uh, no, 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 no. British Petroleum's pockets. He silenced Leo before he could tell the truth. <laughs> yes, yeah, I was like, he was he was saying something scandalous. No, actually, it wasn't scandalous at all. In fact, we'll, we'll go ahead and play it for you. This is, uh, uh, instead, of, Leo, as you know, is, is down in, in, in the South uh, uh, covering E3, but... We didn't want to leave the whole show without him, and uh, he has a couple things to say about uh, the Ford Sync. So let me uh, let me play this again here. So let uh, let's uh, uh, let me um, make sure that I've got everything working here, and we'll be right back with the show in just a minute. But before we do, I really got to tell you about Ford and the Ford amazing Ford Sync. I've been a Ford Sync owner now since uh, last year. And I can't tell you how much I love it. In fact, anytime I try uh, the the uh, the GPS, the turn by turn directions, the hands free calling, and any other make, I go, what? How could how could I have <laughs> how could I have used this? We haven't. I won't say the name, but our Toyota Highlander, the other car in the family, just doesn't cut it compared to this. Uh, I want you to go to SyncMyRidePodcast.com. You can find out more about the amazing Ford Sync. SyncMyRidePodcast.com. Details are there. Video. You can watch Sync in action. Let me give you an idea of some of the features. I mean, we're all making mobile phone calls these days in our car, and you know how dangerous that is. Ford Sync keeps your hands on the wheel, your eyes on the road, while you're making these calls. You press the button on the steering wheel. The Sync says, you know, what do you want to do? You say phone. Then it says, okay, who do you want to call? You say by name who you want to call. Or you can dial a number by number. Never look off the road. Never keep your hand, get, get your hands off the wheel. And yet you can do everything that you'd want to do. For instance, I use it with Dial To Do, which is a great service. And I'm able to, you know, add stuff to the calendar, send email messages and everything, all using the Ford Sync. It's just incredible. It's true hands-free calling. You also get turn-by-turn -turn directions. You get 911 assist, so if something bad should happen, it will call 911 for you, send the GPS coordinates to them. Sync is available exclusively on Ford, Lincoln, and Mercury dealers. It works with most Bluetooth-enabled phones. In fact, I have a number of phones all connected to my Sync, even my iPad connected to Sync, not for phone calls, but to listen to the audio. Um, you get personalized traffic alerts. Music and podcast search on my iPad, on my iPhone, on most MP3 players, on my iPod. If uh, there are traffic alerts and if there's a problem with traffic, uh, it will reroute you with turn-by-turn -turn directions. On, on uh, some phones, audible text messages as well. They'll read you the text messages. Go to SyncMyRidePodcast.com and learn more. And the next time you're in the market for a car, this is, believe it or not, a reason to consider a Ford. There are lots of other great reasons. I love my Mustang, but Ford Sync makes it all the better. SyncMyRidePodcast.com or visit your Ford dealer and get them to demonstrate the fantastic Ford Sync. SyncMyRidePodcast.com. Thanks for letting me interrupt. <laughs> Guys, now back to the show. So there we go. That, that's, what I, that's what I ran into there. And, uh, and I, I have to admit that I like Leo's Mustang too. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah I, 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 I wrote in it uh, all the way from San Francisco to Petaluma, then from Petaluma to the airport last week. And what you don't know about the Twit Mustang is that it is just like being like in a, in a, in a car that's sponsored by you know like Coca Cola. The radio plays nothing but like Twit podcasts, like all to the ride, <laughs> up and down. <laughs> it's not like can we change the station. No, no, no. Let's 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 listen to this week in incandescent lighting. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Almost time in this week in recycling. Oh. Well, it's such a the 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 Mustang is such this uh, it's this odd uh, mixture of muscle car and geek tool all at the same time. So <laughs> yes, it's exactly. a, it's like it, the perfect it, the perfect mix. It is, it is indeed one sweet ride. <laughs> Speaking of a, I uh, long for the day when I can ride in that car. Oh, you haven't been in the you haven't been in the Mustang. <laughs> no, I, I haven't been up to the uh, to the cottage. I'm hoping to come up in September and yeah. get a little a ride around the block. Very good, yeah, but, Danny. But, you, but, but, but very, very, very carefully because Dan was driving, and it was, it was like he had Dad's car. It was, it was, it was oh. like, it was like when, like Flounder, like this is my, this is my brother's car. If there's a scratch on it, he's gonna <laughs> kill me. He only, so he only wipes it with a diaper. <laughs> yeah, definitely. <laughs> So speaking, speaking of uh, of new rides, uh, we uh, Apple has also quietly. It's funny, you know this this continues this this conspiracy theory that Apple's not paying much attention to the to the hardware end of things. Um, when uh, they just kind of quietly, no no real announcements, it just kind of shows up in the lower corner. But there is a new Mac Mini. Uh, Chris, have you taken a look at this? I have. Uh, this is actually uh, they. I think. To, demonstrate that they have kind of gotten a little sloppy about some of the details. This is actually should be the Apple TV 2 yeah. rather than the Mac Mini because that's what this is really designed for. Uh, Apple finally realized that people are using Mac Minis and they get these things and if they're not using it for servers and that kind of thing, they attach them to their television set and they make some sort of odd and ugly connection to the TV. Now they don't have to because this new Mac Mini is really about media. It's got an HDMI port on it. It's got the uh, disc player on it, which people have been wanting in an Apple TV. It also has display ports. So if you don't want to do the straight HDMI connection, you can maybe do display port to HDMI. The hope is that audio goes to that uh, display port connection as well and that you can get an adapter that supports that sort of thing. Well, and, and also, isn't, isn't it um, HDMI now will allow all the copywritten material? So if you were going to do a streaming service, an HDMI connection would be uh, required, wouldn't it? You know, I've gone through here on um, the latest MacBook Pro, and I've been able to get copywritten material to go out through DisplayPort um, okay. into an adapter that then goes to HDMI, and it all goes out through a single cable. Okay, okay. And uh, Andy, have you taken a look at it? Yeah, and I found out about it the way that most people did by incorrectly uh, t by by uh, creating a new window in uh, in Safari, and it bring brought me to Apple's site by default. And oh, I guess there is something new this morning. Uh, <laughs> I didn't get a press release. There was no phone call, no nothing. Uh, and you're absolutely right. It doesn't look like a Mac Mini. It looks like an Apple TV Plus, or it looks like the the, the, the hybrid between the two. The the it's got a lot of features. It really looks really looks great, but. Man, the price! They upped the price. They 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 essentially gave it all the oomph of a nine a thousand dollar MacBook. Same graphics processor, same internal processor, mostly the same capabilities. But the idea of now spending six hundred and ninety nine dollars on a Mac Mini, I'm wondering if Apple hasn't lost the thread. They're, they're, well, they're, the, I, I, I always I always thought that the, the the greatest feature of the Mac Mini has always been the price. The idea that you can lay down less than walk in with five hundred bucks or less and walk out with a Mac. My guess is is that they're looking at at who's buying them. Uh, I mean, Apple of course has more data than we do, but I know that for me, you know, I bought an Apple TV and then I bought a a cheaper Mac Mini and then you know for the at the company and then I bought for myself another another Mac Mini. But I just got <laughs> the most expensive, you know, the one that is as as tuned up as I could get it. And I'm guessing that a lot of people uh, might have done the same thing, where Apple may be seeing the data where just a lot of people are buying the, you know, the 699 version of the Mac Mini. I kind of feel like if I'm going to buy one, I, I think a lot of for, for people, well, for me, I always look at, I have to commit to this thing for a certain period of time. And the $100 difference doesn't mean a lot to me because I'm going to put a bunch of stuff on it. I'm going to be doing all the stuff with it. And I don't want to have to, you know, want to upgrade later. You know, yeah, and and I think part of it is also my own prejudices. Like growing up, I always thought that a desktop Mac or desktop computer is a box about yay big that you can open up the lid and get access to the innards with. And it doesn't, the, the, a hot plate size device is built out of 
CNC'd out of one block of aluminum, just like aircraft, the spacecraft components, and that's an actual quote uh, from the from Apple's tech specs on it. Uh, I don't I, I don't associate that in my mind with a six hundred ninety nine dollar computer. Even though if I look at the specs, they really didn't chimp out on anything here. There's a, a, a huge number of uh, of USB ports. There's a full uh, FireWire port. And not only uh, not only is there that HDMI port, but they are two separate outputs. So if you you can have two screens plugged into this at the same time. So uh, in all fairness. Although I do really think that Apple needs to have a cheaper Mac out there in the product line somewhere. If you essentially took the same thing, stuck it inside a, a Mac LC3 box and kept the price at, at six ninety nine, I'd probably say, yes, that's a handsome product and uh, well worth the five six ninety nine. Right. And it's it's a it's a very compact little it also has an SD card. I don't know if we mentioned that SD card SD slot, uh, right. slot uh, for in the back though. What what an odd place to put it. Yeah. Are, are, you, are you really gonna reach around behind it to to get into your camera card? Why yeah. don't I put it on one of the sides or well, in but the front? It doesn't look as nice. I think that you know it it, it, it it's uh, I th I think I feel like the DVD. So, uh, someone was mentioning today. I was when I I uh, tweeted it and someone was talking about you know it, does it have Blu-ray and I and I was like I was surprised that it had a DVD. I, I was I was surprised it had any kind of way to input uh, uh, plastic. You know Apple seems to be so anti-plastic. Well, now they also have a server version that has no uh, no slot at all. So right, right. Well, and that's interesting. So Apple and I think that Apple has looked at. I mean and. and uh, I felt like they were listening to me. It's like a Microsoft commercial. <laughs> I thought they were listening to me because the, the two ways that I use uh, our Mac minis is one is I have them for media servers. And two, we have, them, we have a lot of them that we use for uh, servers within the office, like little key servers that don't require a lot of hardware. They don't require a lot of stuff. They're not, they're not going to be handling lots and lots of web traffic or anything else. They just need to kind of give us access to a, to a uh, as I said, a VPN or give us access to drives or whatever. They're the perfect little device for that. Absolutely. I, I can't tell you how many times I've walked into a server room or a server closet and you see these big screaming blade servers made by Dell, but somewhere in the middle of it, there is going to be a Mac mini that isn't serving all these files to a thousand different employees, but it's the one that serves all the tools that the administrators use to administrate all that, all that network. So it's, it's a staple of networking. Now, Chris, do you think that the HDMI is a precursor to something like a streaming service? I hope so. Um, I think the fact that they bought Lala indicates that they're interested in this. I don't buy the idea that they needed engineers because it's not like there aren't lots of them out of work. Uh, so yes, I, I do think that they're probably looking at a, a streaming service video as well as audio. Um, I'm not sure how they're going to implement it. Nobody is, but um, it may you know, temporarily be, at least for audio, to be the stuff that you already own and you get it through like a mobile me sort of service where we understand what you have. We're going to make all this stuff available to you through the cloud. But yes, for video, it would be so sweet to sort of say, oh, Apple TV, yes, that was a, that was a prototype for this and this is what we really want to do. What that means is they're going to have to tweak front row or create something else that's a good media application. I like the Mac Mini a lot as a media server, but I do because I know how to operate a Mac and I can do all those multimedia things with it. My family doesn't, and Front Row isn't yet capable enough that it provides me with all the capabilities I need, although it's easy enough for my family to use. I mean, for me, I just want to be able to just use my iPhone or even my iPad to just run the Mac Mini. You know, so I'm sitting there in front of my TV because I have to admit that about... Um, uh, 60, 70 percent of the time that I'm sitting in front of a TV, I'm also sitting in front of my iPad. You know that you know because I'm you know I'm usually fiddling around uh, you know with it you know stuff and if I could just switch over to control the Mac Mini and change the channels and do all the things that I want to do on my iPad, it seems like it would be the perfect little you know connection. Yeah, it's an interesting problem because yes, you can have you can have Wi-Fi control and there are lots of apps that can do this and I've done it on my iPhone and it works really well. But you've also got IR issues because most of your components aren't Wi-Fi capable, so you have to have a, a IR solution. And there are these little dongles that will plug into your iPad or your iPhone. But I've tested five or six of them, and none of them are, are terribly good. You're much better off with a Logitech remote doing that. Mm -hmm. So now you've got the two devices. So we're still looking for that single app IR solution that we can do from an iPhone or an iPad. Yeah. Andy, do you see, the, do you see that, that interconnection between the iPhone and the iPad uh, imminent for uh, what we're seeing with the Mac Mini? Uh, one, one should definitely hope so. If you look at the uh, developer guide, uh, developer capabilities inside the iPhone and the iPad, you see that a, a, a very close level of uh, interaction between those two devices is definitely possible. Uh, also, the idea that this could not 
this could be not just a, uh, a uh, an Apple TV, ex uh, upgraded Apple TV, but also you think about now it used to be a big deal for somebody to have a high resolution computer grade monitor in your house. And if you had it, it was attached to that box that was in your office. Now, every house has two or three devices, uh, HD TVs that are capable of supporting the sort of video this thing will pump out. So maybe it's, a, it's more of a budget thing uh, than, we, than we assume. If we're just assuming that it is designed to be plugged into an HD TV, maybe they are thinking not just the idea of plugging into the living room, but Junior has an HD TV in his bedroom and now that will be the screen for his brand new Mac. Instead of spending fifteen, sixteen hundred dollars on a on a on an iMac, we'll have the affordable $699 one where it's bring your own monitor time. And I, I do admit that I, with my with my Mac Mini, I, I I love being able to just sit there with a wireless. You know, yeah. I can sit on the couch with a wireless uh, keyboard and sit there and, and do a little surfing, and then jump back to, you know, what you know. For me, it's still switching back to Comcast or whatever to watch TV if I want to. But you know, it would be great to just get that completely, um, you know, disconnected. Yeah. So. I'd, be, I'd, say I'd be more. I'd be more pleased if there were a way to get my iPad working with uh, in, in that kind of a way with my HD TV. It still steams me that uh, it doesn't matter how much money you've spent on video content via the iTunes Store. All they're going to give you is an is a VGA dongle that will not output to that because they think that you're going to pirate movies <laughs> via that cable. Well, uh, and, and if a, you're really going to pirate the movies via that cable, I mean, the thing is, is with an HDMI connected to an intensity card, so you get a little. Uh, you know, a hundred and fifty dollar, you know, black magic intensity card, and you take the HDMI out of your Blu-ray player, just a standard Blu-ray player, and plug it in there, and then just hit record. <laughs> you know, I mean, it, it's yeah. it, you know, if, if if someone wants to 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 back up back up their uh, their Blu-ray co collection, it's not any harder than that. Yeah, well, that, uh, but that's, don't that's try this at home. Yeah. <laughs> what? Yeah, yeah. We would never suggest that you should actually do it. We're simply talking about the technology that is available to people with uh, lower moral standards than uh, than we would ever have. That, that's that's no, just, all right. But, but don't you hate this? The, it's the standard approach of saying we can, we are powerless to stop video piracy where it is actually happening, which is actually inside the in the duplicating facilities uh, where they're secured, but they're not that secure. They're going to wind up on bit really good copies wind up on BitTorrent like within days of it being sent out for remastering. Uh, but let's prevent, let's just hit it. Let's just attack this problem in a way that makes sure that people who have no intention and no desire to pirate movies will not be able to access a simple, natural feature of this product they've just paid a lot of money for. Just stinks. I, I, think, I think we just need to have, people need to start wearing t-shirts that say, computers don't pirate software, I do. <laughs> so so it's, that's a, you know, this, 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 this argument looks very much like a gun control argument. You know, where it's only the, only the, the, the evildoers have the have the uh you know have the stuff and it just it, it's it seems like like everything else it's just something that you, it's very difficult to uh to stop so um anyway now speaking of something hard to stop there's also something hard to start uh this is uh in uh uh you have um microsoft actually paying iApp developers to uh, port to uh, Windows 7. This is according to the unofficial apple web blog uh andy can you give us a little uh, information on this uh, just a little bit. Uh, realize that uh, App uh, Microsoft has actually had this gaming platform, so to speak, up and running for nearly a year now because the very first uh, Zune HD that came out for Christmas time last year is the exact same development platform and the exact same gaming platform uh, as we're going to find on Windows System Series 7 Mobile 7 mobile phone platform. I don't know what they're calling it now, but let's just let's just make fun of it no matter what. Uh, and uh, they thought that there would be a, a, cer a certain amount of game development for this device. Nothing has really materialized. They're also realizing that they're starting just absolutely from, from, from step zero uh, with releasing this new platform. So they're giving ca actual cash incentives to developers to try to port their hit iPhone games uh, over to uh, over to Windows to uh, Windows Seven to make sure that they'll have something in the stores when it actually opens. Uh, and I haven't. Uh, this is uh, this is early stuff. I haven't really talked to anybody who's accepted that offer yet. I've talked to a couple of developers who seem to think that they don't want to be that first penguin to jump off the ice floe. Uh, that they're not. That the the terms are that they think they're at Microsoft are being offered is not enough to offset the uh, monumental cost of totally rewriting this 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 game in a totally alien development op development environment uh, they'd have to go from uh, from uh, C flavors which is what they de develop software for for the iPhone to silverlight and other 
bizarre little uh, hickamadoodles uh, to get it working on a Windows uh, Windows phone. Uh, they feel as though they would really have to have enough money up front to pay their staff salary for the amount of time it would take to move those games over, and they just don't see that happening. Chris, is Microsoft in a in a in a bind here? Where sure they have a majority of the PC market, but when it comes to uh, online, uh, you know whether it's uh, Google Docs or uh, mobile devices, it seems like they just can't seem to get a foothold in uh, in any of these markets. Yeah, they're they're really struggling, and it seems odd that that Microsoft should be considering the the behemoth they once were, but. You know, they really have been so slow about so many things recently, getting an operating system out that's, that's worth a damn, um, getting into the mobile space. They, finally, Xbox has broken through, and it's a, it's a viable platform. But in this mobile gaming space, they're up against it. I mean, the App Store is done so well. People, you know, particularly the high-profile developers, are making a lot of money there. Uh, Andy's absolutely right. It's very costly to do this kind of porting. I would also think that if you're a major app developer, you have to think twice before putting your stuff on the app store and then turning and say, oh, by the way, you wouldn't mind so much if we did this for Microsoft too, would you? Because Apple has demonstrated lately that they kind of like to keep their stuff in their store and they don't care so much for people venturing out. So I have to First of all, I think the big name developers don't need it because they're doing quite well with the App Store. And the smaller ones, I think, would be concerned that if they were to go and work for Microsoft, that maybe they wouldn't have such great exposure at the App Store or maybe no exposure at all. Between the App Store and Android, is the oxygen just kind of leaving this, you know, this mobile market? I mean, it just seems like between those, those are the two, the two markets that are working and nothing else is really, you know, it, it might get to the point where it's very hard to launch anywhere else. Yeah, I, th I think that's absolutely right. I think the, the smartest strategy for Microsoft would be to not say we've got the store with 20,000 apps and we are the computing platform of the future. This is a like having an iPad in your pocket. They can simply say there is a great number of people that have very, very limited needs that go outside basic phone functions where they want a working email client, they want a working web browser, and they want access to social media. And if they have a few extra apps outside of that, that's really good. But we're going to make sure that the central experience of using this as a device for communication Communications and media is the most polished and beautiful experience you can get in a handheld device. And right now, we get, if they went if they went with that direction, they would be so far along in that gambit because uh, I, I, the iPhone is still my favorite uh, phone operating system on the planet. But if I could get their media, uh, Microsoft's uh, Windows, uh, excuse me, Zune HD media player on the iPhone, I would probably be using the, using that instead of uh, iPhone's basic built-in media player. It's beautiful. It's simple. It's functional. It lets you do things like just simply say, take disparate pieces of media like playlists, albums, photos, and just sort of pin them off to the side so they're always one tap away from where you want. You don't have to really start uh, burrowing into the menu structure to get access to the stuff that you use all the time. Uh, it's a very, very lovely thing, and I, I, I really want to see what they do with this a year from now. If they stop trying to play Apple's game and they stop trying to play Google's game and they simply try to find people who aren't being satisfied by either one of those those groups, they could really have something there, but it's Microsoft. They, they're, they're low on commitment, and, and I really... I, if there's a, if there's a if there's a row of like novena camels behind me, there's about four of them lit for Microsoft right now in their mobile strategy. Well, is is, is this a is there a issue about time here? I mean, the thing is, is that the longer this goes, the further Apple gets ahead, the further Android gets ahead. It seems like that that battle continues to be more and more of an uphill slog to get to get forward. Chris, well, I think it is, and I think also people tend to think in. Twos, right? There can be two things. There can be Microsoft and there can be Apple, or there can be the iPhone and there can be Android. But, you know, once you're sort of that number three option, people go, oh, and yeah, and there's um, huh, Burger King, too. But it's not in and out and it's not McDonald's. So, yeah, I guess if the other two are closed, maybe I'll try that out. Um, yeah, I don't know. I just, I keep looking at Microsoft and I, I think you've, with all the money and all the engineering talent you've got, what are you doing? You just you just seemed like you stepped in quicksand and you're sinking and sinking. And I don't know, maybe it means Balmer goes and somebody with fresh ideas comes in there. Now, this is on the heels, of, of course, of an announcement that uh, that Apple has now passed uh, 10,000 uh, native apps for the iPad. So this isn't the 150,000 or 200,000 or whatever the number is now for the iPhone, but actually 10,000 uh, apps that are um, available uh, specifically for the iPad. Is 
uh, is once again, this seems like another uh, instance where um, the, it, it's a it's a self fulfilling thing. Once it gets ahead, once you start having all of those applications, uh, it, it's hard to hard to go back. Andy. Yeah, that's that's absolutely true. Apple had a big head start on every other Android uh, Tegra 2 based tablet, and they're still going to be coming out later in the year. Uh, but it seems as though those are being delayed further and further as uh, those manufacturers want to take a look at what iPad what the iPad marketplace is like and make sure that they're building exactly the right product to compete with it. Uh, but yeah, that's a huge head start. Uh, it's not just the number of applications, but it's also the uh, the hearts and the hearts and minds a war of attracting developers that uh, it's taken them two or three months to start to learn how to develop for the iPad. They had the tools well before the launch, but they didn't have the iPads in their hands, which made it pretty much impossible for them to write software. Uh, I've been saying all along that the iPad 2 is not going to be the next piece of hardware. It's going to be August or September when everybody who needed three or four months to develop a really killer iPad app has had those two or three months uh, with an iPad in their hands. I just heard from uh, uh, I probably shouldn't. I probably shouldn't give the name. Uh, but if you, if you, if you were to if you were to name three of the coolest productivity apps for the desktop uh, desktop Mac, you would probably mention the name of this product. It's something I use each and every day. And now they're really really close to saying. Now we're just trying to figure out: uh, Do people want to carry their entire office with them in this app, or do they want a lighter lighter version that they can simply carry around with? Those are the things we're going to start to see in, in August and September. So when these Tegra two based Android tablets come out and they undercut the price by 100 bucks, 150 bucks, 200 bucks, everyone's going to be looking around saying, "Well, where's the software for it? Where if I'm giving you 400 dollars for this tablet?" How can I carry around my documents with it? How can I actually get some work done with it? Uh, and where the, the 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 application that's the central figure of my desktop experience? How do I get that data into this device? With the iPad, they'll say, "Well, you have four choices over there." With Android, they'll say, "There's an open source word processor that." There's a project that in Google uh, Google Code that they think it's really going to be available, or you can just buy the Android version and it'll scale up. Well, do we do we do we think that there's a an issue with uh, you're looking at not only a lot of the apps. I mean, probably by the end of the summer, we're probably going to see 30, 40, 50 thousand apps that are available for the iPad as this thing really starts to ramp up. Uh, do we think that a lot of these uh, Android or all these other tablets? I mean, they really have to exist at three hundred fifty dollars or less, or be able to go head to head with every feature that the iPad has. Do you think that that a lot of these delays are trying to find a margin at three hundred fifty dollars, Chris? Well, yeah, I think I just think it's a Herculean task for them to try to compete. Yes, they can come in for less money and hope that they can find a way to to produce a, a tablet that's worth a, a darn doing that. But I mean, that people are going to compare immediately. And as as Andy says, when they if, when the apps aren't there, and the answer is, oh well, there's Google Docs. Just do everything in a cloud because that's what this is about. Most people are going to say, well, nonsense. No, I, I see what the iPad costs. I can do this. And I've got by this time, 30,000 apps to choose from. Why should I do this? And honestly, I just don't think price alone is going to do it. I, if they come out with a $350 tablet, and if that's if that's the main selling feature, I think people are going to pungle up the extra 150 bucks and get an iPad instead. Well, the other thing is that there are uh, people that, that I've talked to, <laughs> uh, unconnected <laughs> uh, directly to Apple, uh, have said that, you know, that, that, that as they look at all the pieces, they look at all the sections, Apple could probably sell an iPad for the, the lowest version of the iPad for uh, uh, three hundred or four hundred dollars and still make a margin. And so the thing is, is that in the fall, it seems like you know if Apple really wanted to suck the rest of the oxygen out of the system, you know, dropping the iPad and, and they've done this in the past, dropping the iPad by a hundred dollars, I think makes it very you know just just leaves an area that I don't think anyone really wants to compete in. Well, they can always do that. They can use an iPad sh or iPod Shuffle. Uh, strategy with this. And, and basically, when Apple had the iPod, and they said, well, yes, but it's so much more expensive. And we've got, we've got still this area at the bottom that we can occupy. Yeah, Apple, when they come out with iPad 2, could do what they've done with the iPhone 3GS and say, oh, now it's 99 bucks. And for the iPad, okay, so now it's $400. That's it. Well, I mean, you're done. And so you might as well just go home. <laughs> well, a, a lot of it is, it, I think there's, it's really curious to see the difference between the devices that I was seeing in January, each and every one of which looked almost exactly like an iPad in terms of size and shape. It seems as though one of the things that these competitors are experimenting with is 
is there an inconvenience factor to the size and would it be possible to make one that's about the size of a kind of a standard kindle or paperback book something that you could conceivably fit into a back pocket uh that people will respond to uh and i think that's where we're going to find 300 dollars devices and that's going to it's going to continue to kill the kindle uh because kindle always had uh, uh inexpensive uh, inexpensive price and high portability uh back in its side when you start to see a 300 350 dollar android device that's the exact same size screen only it's a color screen Screen and it also has Wi-Fi, that's going to be a big deal. The second area is the ability to simply say, what if we are the one that gives you an SD card slot and we will give you a USB port and we will not have to wait for third-party Bluetooth devices to come in in order to give us the simple ability to move a file in and off the pad? Is that something people like? Well, but, and, yeah, the, the, the horse is pulling away. And, and I know that for, for us, you know, when we're looking at, you know, we're playing around with a lot of development right now in the office. And, and one of the things that, that we're dealing with is the the incredible effort that it would take to get Apple to approve a hardware connection to the uh, to the iPad, you know, where you know that's not something you know, people to talk about getting approved put, to put software on the uh, you know in the App Store. It's at a whole different level to get to get hardware to be um, linked in. And we've talked to some developers who have done it successfully, but it's no minor uh, process. And for us. Uh, you know, when we want to connect it to hardware, you know, cameras or, you know, video cameras or still cameras and, and so on and so forth, trying to get that figured out, um, you know, see, like to us, we, you know, there's been discussions that maybe we should just do this on Android because it would be easier to, you know, interconnect that. And, um, you know, unless Apple streamlines that, I think it could be, uh, you know, a challenge, you know, for some in some markets. And I'm not sure you'll see that streamline. This has been a problem since the iPad dock connector first appeared that, People have been trying to get in and use the uh, dock connector port, and Apple is very tough about that. And it isn't just um, a matter of getting them to open up, but also they take a much higher cut of whatever it is, the device that uh, you're selling, to get in there. So, um, yeah, I wouldn't hold my breath. If I were dealing with hardware and I really needed device A to talk to whatever this tablet device is, I think Android certainly is the better way to go. Yeah. yeah. Now, the uh, another little piece of news here that I, I, I think some of us have been, so I didn't get the email, but some of us uh, got an email that our information had been leaked. So this is a, this was this, this kind of welled up over uh, last week. Andy, can you give us a little bit more information about this, uh, the AT&T uh, leak? Yeah, and I'm actually pulling up my own email right now because I did get one of those. Oh. Uh, and I was I was sort of hoping that it was like press release as opposed to dear valued AT and T customer, please don't hit us. <laughs> Recently, here there was an issue that affected some of our customers with AT and T three G service for the iPad. Please don't hit us, resulting in the release of their customer email addresses. Please don't hit us. Uh, yeah, and so it was. Uh, so there there are a couple of problems with it. It gives it gives it. It's like about a seven or eight paragraph letter that uh, just simply says, "Here's what happened." Uh, a bunch of emails, email addresses got uh, got uh, released on, a, on an unauthorized way. Uh, here's how it happened. We took swift action to prevent any further unauthorized exposure of customer email addresses. Uh, within hours, AT and T disabled the mechanism to automatically populate the blah blah blah. blah. Uh, but the big problem is that uh, the problem was that they were they had instituted a convenience feature that would automatically populate your email address uh, in certain forms so that you wouldn't have to type it in your uh, type it in yourself. And that information was stored in a vastly un secure manner. Uh, and so paragraph number three in here, uh, after here's some additional detail, on June 7, we learned that unauthorized computer hackers maliciously exploited a function designed to make your iPad login process uh, uh, faster, which is, first of all, that makes them think that, that that makes the customer think that, wow, it was Matthew Broderick using a war games dialer and using a World War III <laughs> computer in order to break these passwords. No, it wasn't. It was a very, very badly implemented thing. Secondly, it wasn't necessarily hackers that did it it was uh, there are hackers but uh, i believe that we're correct in thinking that these are white hat hackers who were saying this is a problem you guys need to close this hole uh, my understanding is that they only released this information uh, to one journalist just to get the word out and they say that they deleted all the information that they collected uh, a very embarrassing way to uh, to prove that there's a, a security hole uh, I don't know much about exactly how this information was developed or make, making sure that the people who actually did this hack uh, disposed of that stuff uh, thoughtfully and, and responsibly but I don't think that they I, I, I th really think they should have left that part of it alone they should have said that there was an unanticipated and undoc unknown security hole in the way that we populate this address. As a result, they should have gone so far as to say, here's how many iPads we have sold 
here's how many email addresses we let we we uh, we let out of the barn. It is a small percentage of the total iPad 3G sold. It, but nonetheless, it's a problem. We want to make sure that you that you know about this. It, your passwords weren't compromised. Your account information was not compromised. Uh, however, word to the wise, we're sorry. Please don't hit us. Remember, the, remember that company that dumped all that oil and killed all those birds? We oh. haven't killed any birds. We're not British Petroleum. Don't hit us. <laughs> and, and, and the thing is, is that we, you know, the, the people's, the, your ID, your iPad, and this isn't an Apple leak. This is an AT&T leak. Your Apple, uh, your, your, the ID for your iPad and your email. Now, your email, most of us have lost our email to some, some, one of our friends having their email account hacked. I think mine has been lost many times at this point. Uh, you know, so I think that that is not something that I would necessarily consider private, private. It's, it's, it's kind of like we, we kept the house door really, really well uh, fortified and the porch Eh, we didn't really lock the front screen. You know, you know that that seems to be more of it. Uh, you know, is uh, but it's you know, and and it there was of course the problem that they had of the, some of the people that were affected. Of course, were celebrities, and more importantly, the military. Uh, and so now we have the FBI looking into it, mostly because there's probably some general who had his iP who got that email and is um, perturbed and talking about the fact that we have you know probably you know satellite imagery from Afghanistan on my iPad and is this is this safe? I mean that that seems to be the the concern, Chris. Yeah, I uh, I feel a little left out. They didn't <laughs> steal my email. I didn't get that message. You weren't you weren't uh, part of the uh, of the of the uh, of the upset. I'm just not important enough <laughs> to have my email address stolen, and I I feel well. Oh, I I swore I wouldn't cry on camera. So uh, yeah, too bad. Uh, yeah. Yes. Uh, at and could certainly have taken a, a little more uh, responsibility for this and say, oh, by the way, yes, this, this was our fault and, and we're embarrassed that this happened. Sorry. Yeah. And uh, but and we swear and we'll never do it again. And but there's no oil. And, and there's no oil. Yeah, right. So up, we got we have a couple more uh, stories here before our picks. Uh, we've got Apple changing the, the development rules uh, and uh, and also making it harder to advertise. Uh, so that's coming up uh, in just a second. But uh, before that, we want to thank our, our sponsor, Carbonite. Of course, uh, Carbonite is uh, the leader in online backup. You can back up your PC or your Mac, of course, uh, off-site, uh, securely and automatically. And uh, you can get a, uh, uh, you know, for, you know, the thing is, is you got to start doing this. You got to get your data off of the, uh, you know, off the cloud, uh, you know, into the cloud. You have to get it off into the cloud because the thing is, is that, is that it's just not going to be safe at your house. I mean, I know that when I, I travel a lot and, uh, you know, I worry about this stuff. I worry about it in our office. I worry about it at my house. Uh, so I always make sure that my stuff is, uh, you know, the, the most important data, not everything. I shoot a lot of heavy video and everything else, but my most important photos, my music, my emails, um, you know, those types of things that I really want to keep that I don't, that I don't want anything to happen to. I got to have that backed up somewhere that is not my house and probably not anybody else's house. And that's what uh, Carbonite's is great for. So, of course, you can back that stuff up. Uh, you can recover lost files, uh, restore to previous versions of files. So, if you accidentally did something to the one on your on your drive, and of course, you can transfer files from one computer to another. Uh, you can access those backup those backed up files from, from the Carbonite Carbonite.com website uh, from any computer or via their iPhone app. So, there's a there's a lot of different ways to get to it. Of course, it's secure. So, um, you, you you can choose to encrypt it uh, however you like. Uh, and of course, now you're not worried about theft fires, floods, and all kinds of other disasters that may uh, be inflicted upon your home, uh, but not in the cloud. And again, I always say that, you know, it's two places in the office and uh, one place in the cloud is, is really the best way to keep things backed up. Uh, you know, you can get unlimited backup, so as much as you want there for $5 a month. And, uh, and remember that when you use the uh, coupon code TWIT, uh, you can, uh, and I think, uh, actually, I, I don't think that that's right. I think that we have uh, MacBreak. So you want to use your coupon code MacBreak. Um, and uh, MacBreak is the uh, if you use that, you're going to get two months for free. So uh, it's five dollars a month, only five dollars a month. Um, but you can get two months for free uh, with uh, if you use the coupon code MacBreak. So definitely uh, check that out. And uh, you, you gotta really be thinking about. Uh, you know, I'm warning you. You know, as someone who's lost a lot of data, you gotta be thinking about some kind of uh, cloud uh, backup because it, it it's going to come to haunt you uh, sooner, uh, probably sooner than later. So uh, definitely check it out, Carbonite.com. And uh, now we have our, our, next, uh, uh, our next little uh, story here, Apple changing the, iPad, the iApp development. So Apple, of course, said that 
we're not going to, you know, you can't use any third party uh, tools to uh, develop for the iPhone or iPad and to put it into the iStore. And now it looks like they might have, um, you know, given just a little bit, Chris. Yeah, they have given a little bit. Um, I think it makes it clear that what Apple really meant was when they changed those rules, they said, and we hate Flash. We really hate Flash. We are grinding Flash under our corporate boot. No Flash. And again, please, no Flash or Adobe tools to develop anything having to do with Flash. Uh, and it's a good idea, not so much to stomp Adobe into the ground, but the initial rule was so broad that uh, developers couldn't do certain things that they wanted to. They need these other kinds of tools to do things, particularly game development. If you look at what game developers do to produce the magic on their apps, they have to do a lot of very tricky things. And some of these rely on tools that maybe Apple, using this much broader generalization, uh, they wouldn't be allowed to do. Apple has since tweaked that, probably from the feedback from developers saying, no, no, honestly, we need to use some other tool. I, I swear we won't use Adobe tools in any way, but we do need to change other things so that we can produce apps that look really great on your devices. So, and, and, and so it sounds like, you know, Apple's still not going to approve a, uh, an app that is completely written in some other form. Uh, it, it is really, you know, what they're really allowing for on a case-by-case -case basis uh, is the ability to add little bits of code um, that may right. not be built in Xcode. Does this get, does including these bits of code uh, open a whole can of worms of, you know, censorship and slow approval, Andy? Uh I don't know that I agree with that. Um, I, I think that it's every new piece of information we have about Apple's controls on developers is another piece of the puzzle that makes the, the puzzle harder to read, not easier to read. Uh, there's, it's, I, I think that there are at least eight forces that apply to every single policy change that Apple makes. Sometimes it's in absolute self-interest. Sometimes it is just in the idea of having a tidy and orderly platform. And sometimes, uh, like when they uh, allowed for certain outside game platforms, you know, to suddenly be allowed in Xcode, that's they're realizing that okay, we went a little bit too far. We're going to back it off one notch or two. Uh, but I've, I've unfortunately I've had to accept humility. <laughs> and understand that anytime I try to understand any of Apple's motivations in setting their develop uh, their app store uh, developer development, uh, ha, or phosphoric acid. I'm sorry, <laughs> See, we, we're starting we're starting the show one hour early. I, I I had I had to be sharp at one in the afternoon. I've never been up this early in my life. I'm very very sorry. Anyway, I, I I just think that it's a very complex a very complex system, and that uh, the only thing that we know is that the system is kind of screwed up, and it will remain so for quite some time. Sometimes not to everybody's benefit. I know for me as a as a developer, it just seems like I'd be asking all kinds of trouble if I was going to uh, start adding this stuff that would be one more reason for my app to spend an yeah. extra two months uh, in the approval process. Uh, you know, and, and I, you know, it seems like something I wouldn't do unless I really, really needed to. And maybe that's what Apple is trying to do, is set up a situation like if you really, really need it, you can go ahead and add it and you need to know that it's going to take a little longer to go through. But, but isn't this Right, and you can make your case right. as well. Right. So if you're somebody like EA or, or a, a major uh, Carmack or somebody like that who who can make a significant impact on this device. I think at this point you can make your case with Apple and say, look, we really are trying to stay as close to the letter of law as possible, but we need X, Y, and Z to run on this so that our game is going to be terrific. I think as little tiny developer, you you don't have that kind of opportunity. Yeah, and that's the whole point. There was the I think a key line in the keynote last week was that when he was telling talking about the Apple's claims of the top three reasons why apps get rejected, and they're talking about use of third party for outside frameworks. The line that these these developers know exactly what they're doing. Uh, I think that there seems to be a line drawn between if we think that you are, want to use this technology to get around our limitations, then we're going to slap you down. If you want, if you're trying to use this technology because it is absolutely necessary for the development of this app. Uh, if it's going to narrow the, the the scope of the apps, the app market, instead of expand it, then we are amenable to saying, okay, we're going to look the other way on this one because clearly the letter of the law is out of sync with the spirit of the law. I mean, it, it seems like a lot of the concern, I mean, obviously there's some business concerns. If, if you are 
uh, if you force people to only develop for your app, you know, and, and, and customize it, number one is you get uh, a better application. You, you are going to definitely get a better application by having it developed specifically for that platform rather than develop for the lowest common denominator across six platforms. So that's going to benefit you. It's also, from a business perspective, making it very hard for Windows 7 to move in because people can't develop for both platforms. They have to decide which one is going to be the biggest platform for them mm. to, to develop for. But I think also technically there's an issue of it, you know, if we want to interrupt services, if we want to do stuff in the background, if we want to make sure that things are being started and stopped uh, smoothly, it seems like using those external frameworks are the things that could really gum that up. Yeah. Um, you know, Apple is giving you the frameworks that it controls so that it can do that in the background without you, uh, you know, without having to ask you for permission. That's one area in which I, that's one argument that I just don't agree with that Apple does these things specifically to be anti-competitive and right. to retain, retain control of the market because it's such a complicated operating system and such a complicated development system. If you're going to say that I can, I can, that you're going to write a piece of software for the iPhone and then be able to simply cut and paste code directly off of your, your, your iPhone project and put into a Windows 7 project and that's <laughs> going to be a simple, you want, you expect that to be a very simple and straightforward procedure. I don't know what world you learn to code in because, you know, even if you have the same, unless you're using an interpreted language, uh, that's not going to fly. If, even, if you had, even if you had Apple Basic and you're trying to convert it to Microsoft Basic, you're not going to be able to cut and paste. And it goes beyond the fact that in 1984, you didn't have cut and paste on, on DOS. Right. Absolutely. Now, also in the land of uh, the threats of anti-competitive nature, uh, Apple has uh, changed some of its rules related to uh, you know, apps that use advertising. So this is a, uh, they're making it a little bit more difficult. And basically, the, some of the new rules uh, are stating uh, that if you own a platform, uh, Google, <laughs> if, you make, uh, if, you make, if you make hardware uh, that is like a phone, Google, um, yeah, you can't have a lot of the data that that you would normally have, or that uh, that that other developers may have. Chris, yeah, it's it smells bad. Um, it, it it clearly looks like it's targeting ad mob, as you say. It's Google because Apple was interested in them. Google bought them, and um, and so they're saying, ah, sorry, ad mob, you're you're out. And it does seem like a uh, deliberate decision to cut them out. But it, at the same time, that does sound like I'm wearing a tin hat. So I'm going to defer to Andy on this one <laughs> and uh, and let him state why this isn't evil. Andy, uh, because they're complicated issues here. Uh, because when you it's, uh, imagine, I mean, imagine that you have two competing car companies and product and car company A has a technology built in so the product company B can take a look at every single car they're making, the, the competitor is making, every single feature they're putting into it, every single thing that, that, uh, that uh, they're developing it for future models. Not only that, but also uh, how all of the competitors are users are using their devices. That's a lot of valuable inside information for a company to have. So if, Google's, if Google wanted to have, let's say that I know that Google went to all that trouble of writing out the statement, we're not evil, and I know that there are legal repercussions if they do anything that's evil, evil because they've actually written that out as part of their mission statement. Let's just say, we, let's just be fantasists here and assume that they are a large, huge Golgothical corporation that's interested in being a mega, mega Golgothical corporation. And they can simply say, you know what, through our ad system, we can get a list of every single device that's on the Apple campus. Not only that, but we can find out how every single iPhone user is using their device, how every single iPad user is using their device and use that to just decide how we can best develop a, a, a machine or an operating system feature that will directly compete with that. So when we talk about selfish reasons for them to put, for Apple to put that kind of limitation on, it is a selfish reason for them not to want to give up all their, uh, what could be considered trade secrets to the enemy. Uh, but it kind of makes sense for them to want to do that. Now, there's a user, Apple would probably couch it more in terms of a user experience where we don't want, necess we don't want necessarily to, open, to lower the drawbridge to simply say you can harvest any information you want about our users and profile them any way you wish. That's a not inconsequential benefit, but I have to believe that they're more concerned about, again, a, com a direct competitor to the iPhone using that kind of a hole to get so much information for free on all of their users that Apple would be at a huge disadvantage. And the, and the, 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 the thing uh, that would be, you know, a lot of people talk about antitrust and anti-competitive nature and so on and so forth, and the FTC should look at this. But it seems like it would be hard to say that Google is a small company being oppressed. 
Would you agree, Chris? <laughs> well, yeah, I think that there's a, I mean, where's the line between being a tough competitor and anti-competitive? Google is huge. So I think they would be, have a hard time walking in with sort of a, a shabbily dressed attorney, you know, because that's all they can afford. <laughs> so, you know, look what they're doing to yeah, us. Yeah, and they're, we, they're not going to get Aaron Brockovich to represent them. <laughs> exactly. You know, you can't be, you know, like Jim's five and dime with having Walmart move in next to you, you know, and putting an extension hanging over your shop. It's a big company and they're, you know, we have big people on each side of this one. So I... I think it's going to be a tough case to make that that Apple is is shutting out poor little Google. I mean, in some ways, is, aren't these things uh, from a monopoly or antitrust situation? I think we've talked about this a little bit in the past, but all of these things uh, revolve around this is the time. If Apple's going to set these rules, they have to set them now when they are in the majority, when they don't have when, I mean, when they're in the minority, when they're theoretically uh, uh, fragile, uh, vulnerable uh, in the market where, you know, where when they get to a point, if if they got to a point with 70, 80 percent of the market, they couldn't do these rules. I mean, they couldn't they couldn't shut people out. Uh, if they get larger. I mean, isn't that part of the, the, the strategy that has to be going on here? That's a, I mean, that, that's a good point. But I think that at this point, it's, it's more, it's, it's less of an antitrust thing uh, and more of a thing of let's, let's keep the, let's keep the doors closed before the horses leave the barn. Right, right. Now, uh, the other uh, little uh, thing that Apple added without talking about it at all. I mean, so we didn't see much of it uh, in the in the keynote. Uh, we, you know, we were all talking about iPhones and iPads and Apple slipped out uh, Safari 5 uh, with Reader. And now that Reader has started to uh, sink in, uh, there, some people aren't, you know, completely happy about the whole situation. Chris? <laughs> Yeah, there's this uh, issue that Reader will um, present the user with a very nice formatted page with just the text on it. And all those ads they get in the way that make you move your eye over here instead of be able to go straight down the page seem to be gone. And uh, I, as a user, like it a lot. I also happen to work for a company that depends on ad revenue from websites. And... Um, and even though all of us who work there kind of like the idea, there is the question of people who operate websites who say, well, you know, the reason we have so much of this free content on the web is because there are ads. And if Apple looks like, well, no, we're just going to strip all those ads out so it'll be, make a better user experience, that concerns people that are trying to make a living off this. Andy, is this completely user-driven? Is Apple just trying to make it easier for, uh, for the user or is there some deeper plot? I don't think there's a deeper plot. I think that it was just a cool feature that got shown that uh, it, it's, if I'm going to take a guess, and this is a guess only, this is a feature that somebody inside the team wrote because they thought it was a cool feature. The right person happened to see it and said, wow, that's great. We're putting that in, in Safari 5. And then to a great many people's shock, it became a, a, a bullet item out, on the box feature uh, of Safari 5. Uh, it is technically, it's, it's, it's not, this is not the first time this problem has really popped up. Uh, uh, there's a uh, there's a tool that I recommend highly to lots of people who like to read comic strips called the Darkgate Comics Comic Slurper. That if you have uh, online comic strips that don't have an RSS feed necessarily, it will figure out how to get the comic strip off of that page and aggregate it all of your favorite comics onto one scrolling page. And there are links back to the original. So if you want to go back to the original site, you can take a look at it. But it's a very, very, it really is uh, for me the only way that I can read all the comics I want without having to bookmark 20, 30, or 40 sites. Uh, and the argument against is, of course, they support themselves by ad clicks and ad revenues. And if you divorce, if you divorce all this free content from the mechanisms that causes the artists to be able to support themselves, that turns into a problem. Uh, but the other thing is that I really think that this is a, a case of the web is built on the having to release yourself from counting on how this. Yeah. <laughs> the, 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 the whole the whole purpose when you put something on the web you you understand that you can't control how someone is going to view this how what kind of browser they're going to use what kind of plugins they're going to turn off if they're going to have a plugin that modifies your content if they if it's going to make uh, turn your text to white on black instead of that beautiful mauve on peach that you designed via CSS uh, and if you don't like that then you need to find a different way of publishing things uh, but uh, I, I and uh, the, the the bottom line though I think is that I would like to, I would hope that if I've created my website in such a way that someone needs a special tool to access it and read it in the way that they want, that I'm not delivering that to them. My response should be, I'm going to redesign my site to make sure that people are going to read it the way they want. If I've got so much wickety-whack uh, on, my, on my website that people want to strip it all away and use Reader, 
then I think that means I need to go back to the drawing board. Yeah, the, the, for me, I, when I look at when I look at it, I mean, I have to admit the, the Google Reader. The moment that I saw it, I think it's Command Shift R is, is the, uh, and I just find myself just immediately going up to a website and hit Command Shift R. You know, and especially <laughs> the one that single page versions, I don't really think about it as much. But as soon as I see, oh, this is going to be a three page or four right. page or five page piece, I immediately hit Command Shift R because I don't want to deal with the, the reload, you know, and, and, and as someone who does research for these shows, so as I, you know, as, as, uh, as we do research in the show, we used to use a program called Webstractor just to, and then it was this huge process to get rid of all the, it was still like you'd copy the page and then you'd delete all the pieces and then you do all this other stuff and now you hit command shift r and and then there's a little button at the bottom that says email or uh, i want to save it print it print it directly to a pdf i've been using that to put things on my ipad you know? yeah yeah and, and so the thing is is that it is it is so fast and so easy it, it seems like though the, the timing is is a little scary because you're talking about uh, you know at the same time that the iads are coming out i mean this is you know it's a it's a shot to the uh, you know, the iads seem to, seem to be a shot to the head, and and the uh, reader seems to be a you know a leg sweep. <laughs> yeah. I'm not see, I'm not I'm not sure that the, I'm not sure that part of its basic function is intentionally to to cut out ads because I have done I have clicked that button and saw like ads kind of discreetly tucked away on the bottom. Uh, I I'm wondering if the Apple either directly or just by you know not protecting their their whole card too bad too well is going to. If people people who are upset by this are going to find a way to redesign their sites, not to disable reader, but to make sure there's a way that their ads can be tucked away on the bottom. Like if they can simply sense that browser type is Safari five dot reader, then they will it will it will spit out a different version of it in which all the the important ads like the Google ads, the the keyword ads, are sort of either at, uh, at the very very top or at the very very bottom, so that they at least get credit for a view. Well, and, and I think that the other thing is is that when you look at uh, if they added them as pictures. You know, if they add the, the ads as pictures, you know, those things still show up within the ad reader. The problem with them is, is they're not dynamic. So what it's doing is it's stripping out, an, you know, a lot of the dynamic tools uh, that, that they had uh, to make that actually work. So it's... No, uh, more, no, no more leprechauns barfing out of a dollar signs for my home refin refinance ad. Oh, well, I'll somehow <laughs> I'll struggle to go along. Yeah. Chris, do you think this is, this is the end of web publishing? <laughs> no, no, I don't think so. I think, as Andy says, people will will adapt to this somehow, and uh, you know, week find week a way we'll to deliver fewer content. Fewer albums behind you. <laughs> <laughs> week after week, we'll see fewer and fewer albums behind you as you sell off your collection to buy food for it's, your children. <laughs> exactly <laughs> right. I'd say I'm, I'm just showing the rare ones now because I know those are the ones that are, that are going to go first. Now, uh, last uh, last but not least, we had a. Uh, uh, there was uh, Adobe. It was one of the things we saw. Wired, you know, the Wired magazine uh, came out and sold a lot of copies on its first couple of days, and, and it came out the week before last. But I think we were we were we weren't talking about it all last week. Uh, but the you know, so Adobe now has also released uh, some of the tools. Now they haven't released them to the public. They're really being released to publishers uh, and so on and so forth to allow them to build their their. Uh, uh, their documents in uh, in inside of InDesign and then simply publish to the iPad. Uh, number one is, is is do we think this is a, this is going to be a solid solution? There's a lot of people that talk about the size of the 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 size and the format of the of the wired uh, piece. And uh, is, do we think this is going to be something that's going to eventually trickle down to just being installable with your InDesign, Chris? I think it will be installed, but I have to think that Apple should be working on this solution and not Adobe. I know that, that lots way, and it? lots of publishers. Yeah, go ahead. No, no. It, it seems like I'm 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 kind of amazed that uh, that that we don't see Pages outputting directly to the iPad. That we don't see uh, DVD Studio Pro uh, sending out. To, I mean, no one. Apple doesn't believe in plastic anymore. Why are we even? Why don't we even have DVD Studio Pro if we're not going to export uh, interactive stuff to the iPad? In my opinion, um, but uh, it does seem surprising that Apple hasn't taken a lead on this. But uh, this is this is the beginning. Well, there's certainly a market for it. I, yeah. I know that when this was first announced, every author I knew, publishing company, uh, agent, was talking about having direct control, being able to get stuff into the iBook store and get stuff on the iPad directly. And, and I think when we first heard about it, we thought, oh, okay, well, of course, Apple's going to come up with something and provide these tools for us. And great, we can all self-publish, like we can put music on the site while we can you know, sell various things through the App Store. And yet they've been silent on this, basically. You know, say, well, yeah, we support EPUB. Well, that's that's not the answer. We want interactive stuff. Well, and you're really going to send us to Adobe to do this? I don't, 
I don't think that's the answer. Well, and, so, and, and, and oh, I talked to I talked to I was on a uh, I was you know sitting next to a, a a person who does a lot of publishing for cooking books and everything else, and they said you know from their perspective, if you have a very pictorial driven uh, book that has a lot of stuff that you really want to have precise formatting, that the ebook the EPUB formats. You know, doing the stuff through iBooks just isn't, you know, that's that's not a solution for them. That's not a solution that they want. They want to be able to design their own uh, solutions. And right now, you know, everyone's just writing their own apps, you know, to make that happen. And it's it's ugly. And I think that this is, you know, this is a real, it's not an issue yet, but it seems like it's going to be coming a building issue if Apple doesn't, you know, take a hold of the process. Well, See, it might be a technology. Uh, it, I, I know that a half hour ago I was talking about how you can't build an application and expect to simply cut and paste it onto other platforms. But that is absolutely what uh, newspapers and magazines really want to do, uh, especially because they take certain amount of pride in how they present their pages. That's part of the signature of their magazine. Uh, and if you try to present them with the idea where we're going to give you, we're Apple, and we're going to give you a beautiful design solution that lets you develop an absolutely wonderful HTML5 based dynamic magazine that can only be read on this one device. And you'll have to be start again from square one every single month if you want to develop for any other device. That might not go over well, whereas Adobe, being the producer of the tools that all those design departments are already familiar with, if you give them the ability to simply say, I'll burn off one copy for the iPad, I'll burn off another copy for the Google Pad, I'll burn off a third copy for the HP uh, uh, web OS pad, uh, that is a workable solution for those people. Yeah, but when, I, I got I to gotta believe that if Apple built a really compelling, easy to use development platform for the iPad while they're ahead, you know, while there isn't a lot of competition out there, this would be another industry that they could start to lock up because it's the big industry. And if they made it easy, I mean, I know that I'd be developing all of our stuff for the iPad. And I, and I wouldn't care about the other platforms. I wouldn't care about doing the other stuff if I had an easy way to do it. But right now, it feels like, you know, if I want to put, you know, add all those interactive pieces, I mean, and it feels like DVD Studio Pro or Pages or the mixture of the two. I mean, Pages already lets you bring in movies. It lets you add clickable items or Keynote. You know, Keynote being able to, you know, build these kind of things, it seems like it is like all the applications are so close to being able to <laughs> just, um, you know, output an incredible experience and just not not there. And it just seems like a lot of people would be developing that kind of content if those tools were a little easier, if you didn't feel like you had to learn Xcode but that's, to produce it. That, I mean, that, that's, like, that's like expecting the Wall Street Journal to use just your basic off-the-shelf word processor for all of their layout and all their compositing. Uh, they, 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 there are needs that are particular and peculiar to each publication that are not going to be served by an app like Pages. It can be fine for individual stringers submitting articles and submitting content but when you get one step upstream closer to uh, downstream closer to the reader uh, any large publication is going to want something that is at least 30% custom to exactly their needs. Oh, no, I, I completely agree with it that for large publications, this, this makes sense. Uh, the, uh, my thing is, is that everybody would be doing it for their iPad. You know, schools and right. small companies and small publishers and everything else, if they, if they could have an easy, uh, easy development pr platform to do it on. Uh, and, and right now, it's not clear where Adobe's going. Now, the other thing is, is the other complaint is, is that basically... Uh, what people are saying about the Adobe one is that it's it's building basically two different pages. It's not the most efficient. Uh, you know, the, the Wired app, I think, was 500, uh, 500 megs. It's not the most efficient way to get. It's, it's the easiest way to do it, but it's definitely not the most efficient. It's kind of like building your website in in uh, Dreamweaver where it's, you know, it's, yeah. it, it works. It's easy, but it's not necessarily the cleanest code. Um, so we'll uh, we'll see how that uh, we'll see how that goes. I'm very excited that Adobe's doing it. I just hope, and I, I hope that I get a chance to play with it because I we definitely want to develop and 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 customize stuff uh, yeah. for the iPad, even not even for general release, but just for our members, just for people who are watching. And and it just to us, we just want something easy that we can publish to, um, not something that we're going to build a huge engine around. You know, mm -hmm. and that's the that's the oh, difficulty. If, if if, if I have one worry about it, it's that I hope that this these tools don't lock designers into thinking, well, that's great. We'll just take the magazine that we have right now and reproduce the page model uh, on the iPad instead of developing something brand new that's uh, that's specifically tailored to the idea of holding a slate in your hand that is not only touchable, not only has an infinite page count, not only infinite page size, but also can be 
contacting the mothership uh, with every page turn to mm -hmm. keep modifying itself to suit the needs. If uh, that, that's why uh, the Alex, uh, I'm sorry, not the Alex reader, uh, but there's there, there's a the the. <laughs> yes, sure I like Alex, to I'm read sure. a lot. I read out loud for everyone. They call it the Alex reader. No. Yes, Alex, Al, uh, the Alex reader would be wonderful. It would be specific. It would be spectacular. Uh, but there, but there are other like competing of uh, of uh, uh, news. News Corp has just bought out uh, the that big, famous, huge, uh, uh, huge uh, magazine size page uh, e uh, e ink reader. Where the whole point is to so that to make uh, electronic doc electronic publications that look exactly like their newsstand equivalent, which is just like saying we're going to make a car and the the engine is going to be shaped like a horse and it's going to have feet that sort of propel it forward. And that's, you know, I'm not sure if you're getting this whole wheel well, it's, on a, it, an axle it's, it's, it's sort kinda, of thing that really moves things a lot faster than than, than hooves on, on cobblestones. Well, it, it's kind of like, but that's the way film started. You know, we've talked about this in the past where, you know, we, we, we put a bunch of cameras up and shot people on stages. And then about 1910 or 1912, they were like, you know, what if we... Uh, you know, we could, got naked? we could move the camera around. <laughs> yeah, we, we could move the camera around and then we could start and stop, you know, and, and, and not shoot the whole thing all at one time. And, and uh, you know, it seems like, you know, people kind of attach that stuff. I do think that and some people in the in the chat room have been talking about using PDFs um, uh, that are, you know, you could just put PDFs on your iPad, which is true. The problem is, is that what you really want to do is develop all these interactive titles, develop all these interactive um, pieces to it and have tools that really let you do that effectively. And that's the thing that I think is not, um, you know, there yet. So, so we'll see how that goes. Uh, and, uh, before, uh, and, and I, it's time, uh, to move on to the, uh, to our audible, uh, pick for the, uh, for the week. Of course, audible.com is the leading provider of audiobooks, 75,000 titles. And, uh, you know, you can get anything, whether it's literature or fiction or nonfiction, periodicals, all of that stuff's available. I know that, uh, as many people have heard before, for me, uh, uh, I listen to long form. If I if I'm if it's fiction, I'm watching it on you know a movie. Uh, if it's not what I call linear nonfiction, I just listen to it. You know, I'm not gonna. The only thing I buy in like print is uh, is really. Um, uh, you know, reference material, which I've now started to get on my Kindle app. Um, and, uh, and so the thing is, is that, you know, I've kind of been able to move into that electronic world and Audible is a big piece of it. Uh, of course, uh, you know, if you, um, you can get a free book. Uh, and if you are thinking about getting a free book, Andy most likely has a suggestion. <laughs> yeah, uh, I've got an interesting one. This this is a book that I just downloaded two days ago, uh, and I am now f about three hours into it, and it's about, I believe, uh, uh, 12 to... Uh, I think it's like a 15 hour uh, uncut version uh, of the book. It is Hitch 22, a memoir by Christopher Hitchens. Now I'm recommending it for, I'm, I'm recommending it for two reasons. And I'm giving you one warning uh, at the end of that. Uh, it's, Everything it's it's one of the strong entries I'm looking for in an audiobook because it is a memoir. It's about this this kind of cantankerous <laughs> politico who's had lots of very very nicely worded opinions and nicely formed opinions, uh, and he's essentially telling stories from his life. And some of them are a little bit self-serving, but it's always really really interesting. Uh, the big deal is that it's episodic in nature, so it's not as though you really have to keep driving and driving and driving every single day so you don't forget what happened yesterday. You can really dip in and dip out of it as you go. Uh, and it's every single one of these chapters is like a long form essay. It's not just here's what happened, here's why I went, here's where, here's uh, here's uh, who's who I met. It's just here's what I was thinking at the time. Here's what helped shape my thinking as I became older and older. Uh, and he grew up in the '60s, so hey, yeah, baby. Uh, so, so there's, those, there's there's those two things going for it. Now, there's one negative going for it, and here's where you're going to appreciate the fact that Audible lets you preview just about everything with a very, 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 very long excerpt that you can play right from the site. Uh, Hitchens is has the problem of well, not, let's let's not call it a problem. Let's call it a difference. Well, let's uh, of of being English. Well, let's, uh, let's we can listen to it here. Go ahead. The 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 the, pro the problem is that not that he has an accent. Uh, it, it's, it's it's that he talks like this, and then sometimes stops and starts, and then sometimes he will go like this, and then talk agent a little bit more slowly. But then he gets so into there it is in cold print the plain unadorned phrase that will one day become unarguably true. It's not given to everyone to read of his own death, let alone when announced in passing in such a matter of fact way. As I write, 
in the dying months of the year 2008, having just received this reminder note from the future, that future still contains the opening of the exhibition and the publication of this. So that's so that's what you're. That's kind of the the stop start um, method yeah, of that of that process. He, he mumbles a lot. I really don't think that he was the best person to read this book. Uh, I will be honest, uh, if not for the fact that I had already bought and paid for it <laughs> uh, when I when I took it out for uh, for a drive my, my, the drive uh, on Sunday, I almost bailed on it about 15 minutes in because I was just missing so much of this. Uh, I stuck with it and it got better, or maybe my ear got uh, better tuned to his speech patterns. Uh, so definitely be aware of that. Listen to a good 10 minutes, uh, fi a good five minutes worth of the preview. If you don't have a problem with it, the text itself is very, very interesting. Other than that, you know, just, just make sure you go in with your, with your ears wide open. Very good. And uh, if you uh, want to, of course, uh, get that, uh, you can, uh, let me put, pop this up here. If you, uh, if you uh, are interested in Audible, uh, and, and whether it's that pick or another pick, uh, you're, you know, almost everything that you can think of is up there. Uh, I mean, just about every book that I, that I think of other than reference books, uh, which you would I don't think you'd really want to listen to. Uh, the uh, audible.com slash MacBreak. Uh, go check it out and, uh, and find a book of your own. If you haven't done this already, the book, first book is free. So there's no reason not to go up there and, uh, and get a free book. Uh, audible.com slash MacBreak. Uh, so definitely check that out. And, uh, and, and, you know, it's, it's just a whole different little world. You know, I, I just, I clean to it. I work on the yard work to it. I am sitting planes to it. So it's uh, definitely uh, worth checking out. And uh, so now, without further ado, we're going to move to the picks of the week. Uh, Chris, do you have a pick for us? I do. Uh, my pre-pick is, given my experience today, Verizon for anything <laughs> and everything. <laughs> Wait, by, by the pick. way, did you see? Wait, before before we move forward to the picks of the week, did you? This was something that someone brought up in the in the uh, chat room. Did you see the MiFi hack for the for the iPad? So, <laughs> no. Someone has yep. figured out how to take their MiFi, disassemble it, and install it into their iPad so that they can actually have a MiFi in their iPad, and it actually it's works. Very nice. <laughs> Um, so you can do this that. Is over. I'm I'm all over that. Yeah. I, <laughs> now, do, do do you think that like inside Apple, like you know, someone has actually t printed this out, pasted it onto a big like board, and just shoved it in someone's face, saying, "Now do you understand that we have a problem?" <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this is not this is not the act of someone who is happy with their AT and T service. I am. I, I have to admit, I saw that hack this morning, and I was so tempted to <laughs> to tear my. You know, I was like, mm, this might be a weekend project, uh, taking this thing apart. And and I'm not. I'm just. I have to keep on thinking about it. Like, I have a MiFi. I have an iPad that doesn't have. You know, 3G. Should I bond these guys together? And and uh, it may happen. I, I may I, I may need a little uh, technical assistance. But I've got it's like the friends. human centipede only with Apple hardware. It's 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 vulgar, but it's effective. Yeah, exactly. So Chris, your pick. Oh, my real pick. Uh, right. My real pick is a uh, is an application called I don't know if you can see it with the glare. It's called Lyrics Plus. It's uh -huh. um, it's two bucks, um, and it's for finding lyrics on the web and it, this could be lyrics that uh, for songs that you have in your music collection or lyrics with, that you're uh, searching for specifically the something that happened with lyrics a while ago is that there was a main site called lyric wiki that people would go to to get lyrics and they managed to get in all the lyrics you would ever need to find on the web and the people who were in charge of making money off lyrics found out about it went over there and said i no, you don't so they shut off this capability to share out the, share the database with applications. Um, but if you were of a noble mind, you actually contacted this governing body and said, we would like to license this stuff and pay for it. And so a few app developers have been able to do that. And Lyrics Plus is one of them. It's made by a Schroeder Development LLC. Again, it's two bucks. It's on the App Store. It's not available for the iPad in an iPad native version, but it works perfectly well on the iPad. It looks good scaled up. And it's very fast, and plus you can play your songs from your music collection directly within the application. Uh, if you like lyrics, if you want to know what the singers are saying, it's absolutely worth the $2. I love having lyrics. I mean, because a lot of times I, I can't understand what they're saying. I think I'm just too old for certain lyrics anymore. And, and I remember the old ones, that, and they slowly sink in. And, and 
it's amazing how you, you see how sometimes, you know, with some songs, it's not important because there's songs that I've loved for a long time that I have absolutely no idea, you know, what they're saying. Um, right. And, uh, <laughs> and then when you actually read them, you're like, oh, I didn't, uh, yeah, I didn't, that didn't completely sink in. Anyway, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a lyric fiend, so that, I'm definitely getting that. Uh, Andy, cool. do, you ha do you have a, uh, a pick for the week? Yes, uh, it is an iPad accessory. Uh, then here is my iPad. I'm going to be doing something quite magical with it that you will see in just a second. It's the amazing levitating iPad. Uh, it's because <laughs> I've got this thing called the X Band uh, by TKO Solutions. It is Ooh. essentially S and M bondage gear uh, for your <laughs> for your iPad, uh, but it's like four very nicely done leather straps that hook into the corners and hold it very securely uh, and a neoprene back to it that still shows the Apple logo. I have a sticker over mine, but it would show you the Apple logo. Uh, so those of you who are worried, like if, if you tend to use it in like standing up and walking around sort of uh, places, uh, it holds, it really sticks it to your hand like very, very nicely. Uh, you can do it that way. You can do it horizontally. Uh, I prefer to sort of hold it kitty corner like that, and that's why the hole is there, not just to uh, have brand logo awareness, but also so that you can hold it uh, on the diagonal like that. Uh, and it's actually very, it's very, very handy. I'm surprised at how often I, I got the, the 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 guy who designed it sent it to me about a month ago, and I had it with me on that Mac Mania cruise. Uh, and I'm I was surprised to find how many how often I was actually using it uh, because I, I do like to have a certain tactile control. Uh, over the iPad, and this sort of prevented me from worrying about it being dropped. But one of the nicest features of it, and this uh, it avoids one of the problems that I tend to have with a lot of different uh, iPad cases and solutions, is that when you take it off, I mean, it's just cloth, so that you can just simply, you know, sort of fold it up and stick it in a pocket. So when you're not using it, it just doesn't take up any space whatsoever, uh, nor does it screw up uh, the nice lines of your iPad. Uh, and for all that, it is $19.99, which doesn't seem like a whole lot of money to me. Uh, and uh, the guy's just getting started. Uh, he just cut the web. I, I was going to recommend this a couple of weeks ago, but he's just only now gotten the, his website up and going. Uh, and uh, you can get it at uh, tko-solutions.com. But as in, as in, as, as, as in the last three letters of my name, I just noticed. Uh, so <laughs> tko-solutions.com. And they, they, it jumps straight to cowbell. Oh, there we go. Hold on. It was go. <laughs> <laughs> when you when you type it in. Here's the. Uh, uh, here is the uh, picture of the the website here. The uh, when you type it in here, it, up, if you look at the the, the URL, it says uh, tksolutions.com slash cowbell. So evidently, it's just a matter of having enough cowbell. So uh, again, in hand or on hand? Is it on hand? On uh, hand. I, I, th the, I think the product is called the X Band. Okay. I'm not sure what the, if the on hand is the name of the company that he set up to actually sell them. So on hand by I'm reading it on hand. By TKO Solutions, introducing the X Band. <laughs> Very but, good. Looks uh, like a great. Uh, uh, go ahead. I get. Uh, I'm just, yeah, I was just about to say. I mean, it's it's handier than you than you think it might be. Uh, but if, if 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 you're the sort of person who's kind of active with their iPad, uh, it's the sort of thing that if you just have that in your pocket or in your bag, you're probably going to have that on uh, and work using it a lot. I've, I've been using it a lot more. I, I was I thought it was a cool little thing that I just wanted to try out, and I thought, oh well, that'll be fun for a day, and then I'll probably never use it again, or I'll give it away. But no, actually, I've been using it. <laughs> Quite regularly, I actually have a perfect pairing, a perfect pairing for your uh, your uh, little attachment there, uh, because that that looks like the perfect thing to go with my pick, which is a it is a you know this is a little bit of a um, uh, this is a film geek app, um, and this is here here it is, uh, and it's a little blown out when you actually see it, but this is called Movie Slate, and uh, I saw this. I think we covered it a little bit at in. Um, at Macworld, and you can't see some of the pieces here. I think uh, it's a little, uh, if I turn it just a little bit there, you can kind of see the, uh, it was a little overexposed on the camera. But uh, what you have here is a smart slate. Now, I need to uh, qualify something for people. Uh, a smart slate is uh, something that costs a lot of money. Uh, these are $1,500 each, and uh, a company called Denneke makes the ones that are probably the most popular. And uh, when I saw this at NAB, I was like, oh, they should be so frightened because this is really to me this is the future of where uh, apps are going which is really taking over things that used to be complex code that was really like leds i mean they're really low quality you're like i can't believe i'm paying fourteen hundred dollars for these little spinning leds and here you have something that does uh, just about everything that a slate does really everything that a slate does and a lot more uh, the date you can just say oh i just want that to be today 
Uh, I don't have to write any of that stuff in. It keeps track of your, you know, role scenes. You don't have to, you know, remember a lot of that stuff. Uh, you know, you can type the stuff in. I, I, I can't tell you how many times I've been on a set and you can't read anything that someone, and a lot of times the people that you pick, you know, this isn't a very technical job, you know, doing the slate. And a lot of times the people you pick are people with good handwriting. <laughs> you know, it's like, I don't, we don't know how good they are, but we, we can read whatever they wrote on here in a rush. And so, um, and, and I think that this is the, the first step. I mean, I think that, uh, you know, the next step of this is being able to drive this data from a remote location, you know, having this, inter, you know, intersecting with the script supervisor that's sitting in the back, able to just have the slate. No one has to write anything on the slate. Right now you do. But I think that, you know, where I think this could be going is something like that in a, in a more integrated pipeline. The, um, uh, it is, but with that little handle that you were just showing with the little case, it would be perfect because you could sit there and just hold it out uh, right, right in front. Now you can also, of course, you know, you can hit, there's the, and which is, uh, is, is kind of a cool little thing for the, for the actual slating. Now, what I really wish that someone would build is a little case for this, that you could actually, uh, you know, that you could actually have the, 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 the physical okay. slate uh, and simply have, all the, have this kind of connect into it uh, and become part of that because there are things that you still want to be able to do with it. But it's, a, it's, a, it's not the cheapest app. It's $20. Um, there is a $50 in-app purchase that really makes this thing pretty sick, which is that it... Um, through the headphone jack, you can actually have jam sync it to a uh, to a world uh, time code generator. So I know for some people who are watching, you don't know what a world time code generator is, but being able to jam sync your iPad to one is um, yeah, it's cool. So uh, so anyway, uh, you know that's, that's that's all I have to say from a, from a uh, kind of a geek uh, perspective. It's a pretty select piece. Uh, if you were if you were thinking of a, of a smart slate, most of us don't need. Uh, most of us, this is all you would need. And for $70, we pay $50 every time we rent a Denneke slate. So, you know, the idea for $70 of being able to just, just have one that doesn't catch fire, like the two of the ones that we had. <laughs> I don't know why, but they, they, they um, you know, um, they started smoking and uh, made us a little scared. So, um, uh, and, and, and I think for, for a lot of people, that's not going to be something that is, uh, uh, you know, you're going to, you, it's fine to do whatever you're doing now, but if you're really doing this stuff and you need a smart slate and you want something that isn't going to cost $1,400 and you already have an iPad, uh, it's called Movie Slate. And, uh, you know, with Andy's little uh, handle there, the two of them paired together. Look at that. See, we hanging on to it. That is like the perfect, look Real at this. Look speed. at this. <laughs> Exactly. Exactly. I think it's a, it's the perfect little um, perfect pairing uh, of of these two things. And it's Movie Slate. And as I said, it is uh, it's really really uh, a great little application. And I I highly suggest it. My other um, go ahead. What were you saying, Andy? Uh, I, I just I just want to say that's actually a very very useful thing. You, even if you're not a professional producer, uh, I have like a similar little app. I'm not sure if it's made by the same ones, uh, same guys. Like same. On my I think it's the same. I think it's the same the same program. I, I, I thought so. Uh, and it's actually very very useful because. I don't have the ability to have time code, or it's not even worth it for me to have time code. But I might have my real, my, my nice uh, professional, my, my nice consumer grade H, uh, HD camcorder that costs five hundred bucks. But I also have like a little movie camera on my phone, or I might have a little flip video camera. Uh, and if when you get into Final Cut, it's very very easy to do like a master shot and then uh, then a, then a two shot at the same time. If you just point them both, all point them both at this, do this, and oops, I do it right. And then simply, when you're in Final Cut, simply make sure that they're all synced to that beep and that's and that one frame. Right. And then for the entire rest of that shoot, it's it's not professional, but you will have all your video and all your sounds synced up. So if you want to go to, gee, actually something really after after the kid hit the hit the ball, I want to go go to the master shot so I can see the the play on the field. You're no longer trying to say, okay, where was that? Wait a minute, was there a shout that I could sort of sync on because all your cameras are synced up? It's a very cheap way to get well, really really slick effects with very very cheap hardware. And the two other solutions for that is people who are listening to uh listening is that uh there is a um uh, number one is that when you have that smart slate so you see that time code going if all the cameras are seeing that time code going by you can go into final cut and there's this secret little thing in final cut where you can do modify time code and you can actually type the time code in that you're seeing on the slate and you don't even have to find the same time code to do that you simply can find any time code you type it in and it syncs all the it syncs all the tracks uh -huh. so that smart slate that you don't even need the beep because you can just go in and just say just find a frame where you see the smart slate uh, type that in and it'll, it will then replace the time code that was in that clip um, with a new time code uh, that then you know creates a and if you do that with each uh, angle uh, all of those will have the right time code from then on um, 
The other solution, which I'll just make another pick right now since we're talking about all this, is a, is a plugin for Final Cut called Pluralize. So Pluralize is literally, um, when I showed it to one of our editors in, uh, in the office, uh, there were tears in his eyes. And I, I'm not, I am not, I am not exaggerating. Like I asked him, I gave it to him for two days and, and, and he was like, he, I said, how is it? And he was just like, oh my Oh my gosh, it was just, because yeah, we sing, we do multicam constantly. And, and what Pluralize does is it just examines your, your whole, uh, Pluralize examines all the audio in, your, in each track and just automatically syncs them. So you just set them all in the, into the thing, you add the plugin and you say, you know, you just hit sync and it just goes, and they're all done. You know, you know and, and there's, no, there's no thinking about it, there's no whatever. And, and, and it can do it, you can have a, a cell phone, a professional and a camcorder you know all you know together just looking at the sound and just going well i can just sync this all together and so um pluralize is the is the thing that you know for us if you if you want to spend 150 dollars, I, I think it's about 150 dollars. Uh, if you're doing multicam it's it's if you're doing um uh if you're doing the basic uh you know i just want to grab some stuff and do it in final cut or final cut express uh you know the um the beep is is you have to have something that's both sound and visual and then if you're, I don't know if Final Cut Express will let you modify time code. So if you're doing Final Cut Express, being able to have the beep would do it. If you're in Final Cut, being able to type those things in. Um, anyway, this is, this is a, um, the only reason I, I, I kind of went down this path is this is um, an area that uh, is very painful for us, or it has been for the last five <laughs> or six years. Uh, and, and, and we've uh, slowly uh, watched these solutions uh, grow. We, we kind of pay attention to, to each one because we deal with it on a daily basis. So <laughs> I've been and able that to concludes this so episode of This Week in Simpty. <laughs> <laughs> well, we didn't... I, I could explain how Simpty... No, 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 no. No, no, no please yeah. don't. No, 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 no. Anyway, so a uh, so little, little geek fest for those of you right at the end of the show. Uh, we didn't want to scare you off at the beginning of the show, um, you know, with that, but uh, hopefully uh, hopefully you enjoyed that. And, uh, and it's, for those of you using Final Cut, um, you know, it is, uh, it's, it's, it's a cool thing. And once again, it's from singular software is uh, where Pluralize comes from. If you're doing multicam editing or you want to do multicam editing uh, and you're going to do it and you're willing to spend part with $149, it is worth every penny. So, um, so anyway, that's it. And uh, Chris, where can people find you? People can always find me at macworld.com. And uh, Andy, and that's where can people find you? If you can spell my last name, uh, go to anotgo.com. If you can't spell my last name, but you have a good ear for four-letter acronyms, uh, go to cwob.com, the celestial waste of bandwidth, and that will redirect you to where you want to go. And uh, until next week, uh, this uh, break time is over. Get back to work. 